Welcome and thank you for coming to speaker series today. Um, happy Friday. I can't believe it's almost Halloween. <laughs> um, just a little bit of housekeeping for those of you that are here in person who would like to receive credit for attendance. We have the code um, listed on the wall there for you and you just go to slido.com to put it in. Um, so we're very excited to have our speaker here today. There are distinguished alumni from the USU program. Um, I'm going to introduce Dave Anderson, who knows them very well, um, who will then turn it over to our speaker. Um, so Dave is a, a professional practice associate professor in the LAAP. Um, he has been teaching and doing extension assignments. He's been here since 2012. I'm sure most of you have taken a class with him or seen him around. Um, from 1995 to 2014, Dave worked as the assistant director of the Utah State University Botanical Center in Kaysville, Utah. And the US UBC is a 100 acre facility owned and operated by USU, dedicated to the mission of promoting resource conservation. And if you all haven't had a chance to go it's a beautiful site um, with amazing plantings. Um, so Dave has extensive experience and interest in water conserving landscapes, regional identity, sustainable design, community engagement, and environmental, environmental education. He serves on USU Sustainability Council and the Architectural Review Signage and Arboretum Committees. He is a member of the American Society of Landscape Architects and currently is a member of the ASLA Executive Committee, serving as the liaison to the committee from Utah State. He has a bachelor's degree in ornamental horticulture from Brigham Young University and is a proud alumni of our program. And so give Dave a round of applause. <laughs> Did you notice that Julie kind of choked just a little bit when she said Brigham Young? <laughs> anyway, <laughs> thank you. Uh, it's a great opportunity today for me uh, to get um, a little bit more re reacquainted with Kevin. I ran into him in the hall a little while ago. Haven't seen him for a long time. Um, Kevin, as Julie mentioned, is uh, a distinguished alumnus from our program this year. And that's a, a really nice thing. He graduated in 1990 uh, from our program and then um, went off to California for a while and worked there, I think, for something like seven years. His current position, though, is he works for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter day Saints and he's the senior landscape architect for uh, their. Um, temples and special projects uh, division. And that's a pretty interesting and unique position to be in because he is, uh, rather than doing, he's not out competing for work, but rather he is hiring uh, design professionals and consultants all the time and helping them through the process of designing and um, implementing, building uh, these these very unique places all around the world. And so that is, um, he has no lack of things to do. I was talking to him and he's not uh, kind of twiddling his thumbs. When he started, I believe there were about 50 temples uh, worldwide and in 1997. So 24 years later or so, there are somewhere around 230, 240 uh, either functioning temples or um, announced or in process somewhere along the design process. And so he's involved in many, many of those things. And so that's a pretty uh, challenging and uh, unique position to be in because every one of those uh, projects is somewhere else, uh, except for where you, you're involved in the Temple Square project as well in downtown Salt Lake, but everything else is 
somewhere around the world. And so the conditions are different, the requirements are different, the specifications are different, and uh, climate, everything. And so uh, it requires a, 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 what I would say a tremendous amount of adaptability. And so uh, he's been involved in, in many unique things um, for a long time. He was involved in the conference center. I don't know if you'll talk about the conference center project, but that's a 10 acre site of intensive um, construction and uh, with a huge um, rooftop garden that's extremely unique. And uh, they're currently working on 20 acres of the Temple Square uh, and Church Administration Building uh, project, re remodeling that completely. So anyway, Kevin has a lot going on and he's a wonderful uh, representative of our department. He's a great Aggie. They live in Tooele and he's out, uh, he's out and about as an Aggie there on the Aggie Alumni Committee and uh, raising money to help students go to school and all kinds of things. So thank you. Uh, Kevin's here with his wife and uh, we appreciate you coming and we'll turn the time over to you. Thank you, Dave. Uh, can everybody hear me okay? All right, I'm taking my mask off anyway. Thank you. <laughs> um, first of all, uh, uh, thank you for letting me uh, come and speak to you the, this afternoon. I know there's a thousand things that all of you could uh, and would rather be doing at 3.30 on a 65 degree fall day, beautiful Cash Valley day. Uh, I'm going to talk about that a little bit uh, coming up, but a um, little order of business, uh, Sam. I, I promised Sam, okay, Sam's going to help me. In my uh, presentation today, since it is, you know, uh, one of our favorite holidays coming up this weekend, I thought I'd uh, join in on the festivities. I'm going to have some slides up here, and if, if we can do it in an orderly manner, Raise your hand if you think you know where this picture was taken or what it is taken of. Uh, go ahead and raise your hand and Sam will give you a treat of your picking. Uh, any leftovers are going to him. All right. So I'm going to put you in charge of uh, determining who raises their hand first. Some of these are going to be very, very easy uh, answers. Others, maybe not so much, but most of them are. Um, first, uh, and I want to say, uh, landscape architecture students, wow, uh, having the opportunity to uh, come uh, visit with some of your classes this morning and seeing what you are doing now versus what I did when I was in those same classes uh, and, and those experiences, um, what a quality, quality education you're getting and quality work you are doing. And uh, I commend you. And you're coming into landscape architecture at a time when landscape architects are really thought of in the, uh, in the building process a lot more than they were when I graduated in 1990. Uh, so uh, I wish you all uh, much luck and uh, a great, uh, great career in, in whatever you end up doing in landscape architecture. I'm going to see if this works. The clicker doesn't work. Or does that go that way? Does that go that way? Okay. <laughs> Technical. Oh, because it's not on. It's got to be clicking on here. There you go. All right. Um, so before I get started, I wanted to tell you a little story about my experience here at Utah State. This is Professor Dick Toth. At the time I was here as a senior, um, Dick was the head of the department, uh, a, a no-nonsense kind of guy, as you can see in the bottom picture, and those pictures a little it in it can be a little intense, a little intimidating, uh, especially to a, a student who's just trying to learn. He actually came from Harvard to Utah State. Uh, it's 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 an amazing connection that that Harvard and Utah State have with each other. But uh, anyway, he was the head professor when I was here. And if any of you have been in a critique or what we called back then uh, a jury, 
where you put up your presentation on the wall and then uh, you get to explain it. And I noticed today, which I think is really awesome, that a lot of work you're doing is within teams, but at that time, not so much. This was my senior project, okay? My senior project, um, the night before, I had just finished up my senior project. And it became about, oh, midnight, one o'clock in the morning. I was, at, I was at home finishing up my project, went to color it. Back in those days, we used markers. And uh, went to my marker box, pulled out the ones I wanted, dry, dry, dry. All of my markers were dry except for four colors. A gray number seven, which is a dark gray, a, a, a bright blue, orange, and fortunately, one ugly green. Those were my four colors. So my wife uh, helped me I, uh, just color those up as quickly as I could. And I put it together, four sheets, and the brightest, ugliest colors you'd ever seen. Uh, back then we were using blueprints and then I put a mylar over it. So it kind of subdued those colors. And the next morning went to, went to the class and we all had our scuff stuck up on the walls, all the senior class. This is my senior project. Get into that jury room, the lights go down, the spotlights, you're sitting right here in the spotlights, right here, and the lights go down and um, the kid before me, the student before me, uh, we all knew didn't spend a lot of time on his project. And I don't know if the professors got wind of that or not, but they, when he got finished with presenting his project, they ripped into him big time. Told him that just everything that he did was just absolutely atrocious. It was a, a, a weak attempt. His explanations of design were, were, were not good. And the whole staff of professors were all there. Now they're in a bad mood. Okay. <laughs> I'm next. So I stand up and I'm sitting under these spotlights and I can just feel myself just sweating profusely. Because I know that I, the night before, I only had four colors to my presentation. And here it was, front and center in front of everybody. And I made my presentation. And I'm just sweating profusely. Professor Toth can probably see it. Maybe felt a little sorry for me. And uh, he gets up after my presentation. He gets up and he says, Kevin, that was a wonderful presentation. That was a beautiful design. I like the way, I like what you did. You, you could have done this little area a little bit different uh, just as a critique, but overall, I love the colors that you used in your presentation. <laughs> You've unified your entire, your entire presentation on all four sheets. And I'm like, oh my gosh. <laughs> and, and uh, he, gets, he gets through with all those accolades. And he looks at the rest of the, rest of the uh, uh, faculty. And he says, do any of you have any questions for Kevin? And one of the, uh, I, I don't know if she was a student advisor or, or uh, uh, not full professor, but she was kind of a, new, a newbie uh, to, to the group. And she says, yeah, your circulation uh, doesn't seem to work. What, how do you get from here to here? And Professor Toth looked over at her and, and he said, can't you see? And weren't you listening to how Kevin explained that? <laughs> she, just, she just quieted down and, and, and Professor Toth said, are there any other questions? <laughs> I wanna thank Professor Toth for giving me the courage and the confidence um, to become a designer, become a landscape designer.
um, without that presentation, if he, if they would have just hammered me like they hammered the one previously, I don't know where I'd be today. So I just wanted to say thanks to him and uh, all of the professors that taught me uh, during school, which we had a number of amazing professors up here. Um, today, um, they asked me to have a topic, temples. Uh, sure, I, you know, what do you talk about temples? But I wanted to focus kind of what we are focusing on with our temples in creating a sense of place uh, for temple sites. As I, as, as Dave mentioned, I've spent uh, now, I began my career with the church back in 1997. And, uh, and for the most part, since probably about two, 2003, I have been, uh, I've been uh, helping with a lot of temples. And to many that might be in the Zoom, uh, that might be listening, uh, maybe some of our consultants are out there. Uh, but uh, like Dave said, I work with ama an amazing group of people that are all landscape architects throughout the world. Uh, many here in Utah, but many more throughout the rest of the world. And I get, to, I get the awesome opportunity to um, to just learn about different parts of the world that you, I, I, this boy from Tooele would have never imagined uh, going to the places and, and seeing the things that I've been able to, to see. So I wanted to talk about a sense of place uh, that we're trying to create for each temple. Um, this is where you raise your hand and say, I know where this is. Does anybody know where this is? Where? That's the USU Aggie football stadium, right? Get your candy. Um, whenever, whenever my wife and I, we come into Cache Valley, it's a special place for us. It's a second home. This is where we met. Um, this is where we spend a lot of our time. We have three of our four kids that still live up here. And uh, what a wonderful thing that we have to come to such a beautiful place. For us, this is a special place. Okay, what creates a sense of place? I'll just read it. The term sense of place, according to Wikipedia, is a multidimensional complex construct used to characterize the relationship between people and spatial settings. It is a characteristic that some geographic places have and some do not while other, to others, it's a feeling or perception held by people. Oftentimes, a, a sense of place is created, uh, I, I took it down to three, three things. One is identity. We can identify something, right? So, for example, if I say Eiffel Tower, all of you know what that looks like, right? All of you know where that is, right? You may have never been there, but it is a distinct uh, item in the world that most people know about. Attachment. A sense of place can be had by a sense of attachment. Do you have a special place uh, along the Logan River that you just love? Um, do you have... Um, do you have a, a, personal, a personal place that you like to go study that is just kind of your favorite spot? And then activity. An activity could be um, something that has affected your life. Uh, a wedding. Say you got married somewhere. Um, an event. Maybe uh, if, I, if I mention 9-11, what place do you, does, does, comes to your mind right offhand? New York's ground zero, right? Which now has a sense of place, whereas before, maybe not so much other than we knew there were some big buildings there. And so those, using those three uh, as a sense of place, how does, a, how does a place become a sense of place? Well, identity. I can take a, 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 a basically a boring square. I put a silver bean in it, and now, Thousands of people come and take a picture there every single day and they put it on Instagram and 
and whatever chat you want to do. And now everybody's got to get that, right? How many have done that? Anybody? Uh, everybody? Okay, we've got a few bean lovers. All right. All right. Okay, just uh, uh, for another candy bar, where is the bean? Okay, did you raise your hand? <laughs> right back here in the blue. Chicago, right? Millennial Park in, in Chicago. Um, uh, a great park. Uh, but interestingly enough, if the bean wasn't there, this would be the most boring part of the park. But now with the bean there, it's, it's the attraction, right? Um, if you don't have a normal place, here's another raise your hand. Do you know where this is? Can anybody tell me? This is a little bit harder. No, really? Oh, is it in Orlando? No, no, it's not in Orlando. Okay. This whole town is like this, all right? They have buildings that are upside down. They have King Kong climbing on buildings. They have the half the Titanic right on Main Street. Okay, this is Pigeon Forge, Tennessee. Of course. Have you been to Pigeon Forge? Okay. But Tennessee, right? Oh, okay. All right, so. Yeah, so another way, another way to create a sense of place is to do something totally unique. Uh, I already mentioned the Eiffel Tower, absolutely new, unique in the world. But this is another thing that can make something unique is to make something really strange. Uh, turn a building upside down. All right. Also identity. Go ahead. Oakland. Oakland, Oakland California. I put Oakland in there not because it's an identifiable uh, building uh, in its architecture. But did you know that the Oakland Temple is used by both the Oakland Airport and the, the uh, ships in the Bay as a, as a guidance and a beacon for the entire Bay Area? They use this, I've talked to pilots and I've also talked to others in the shipping business and they use this to navigate uh, into the airport, into and out of the airport and, and through the bay, uh, especially on those foggy days because it's lit up and it's, it's, it's the brightest spot on the hill and they can see it and they know where they are uh, based uh, in relativity to where they need to go. Attachment. Anybody know where this is? Here, what, okay, that's old Maine, but what's, what's the grass called? the quad okay is there anything really special about the quad in its physical nature not really it's grass surrounded by some trees right with a couple sidewalks going in it really not much but can you imagine if somebody tried to put a building right there what would happen uh yeah there would not be there would be a lot less money coming to this community and this uh, uh, university, if that happened. Um, attachment. So we have an attachment to areas. Um, another story. Um, this is, raise your hand if you know. Yosemite Falls. Okay, this is Yosemite Falls in California. Um, Along with telling you about temples, I just, I kind of wanted to tell you a little bit about, you know, I shared the story with being a student here, but also when I was, when, before I came to work for the church, I worked in Central California. And for me, this has a place of attachment for me because one weekend, the landscape architect for Yosemite National Park invited me up. He said, Kevin, do you want to come up this Saturday? I've got four landscape architects coming up to decide what to do with the trail to Yosemite Falls. At that time, it was just a dirt, uh, a meandering dirt trail. There wasn't anything formal to it or anything like that. And so I got invited up uh, to, this, um, to this little charrette that they did. And uh, when I got there, I realized that these four landscape architects that he had invited were the who's who of landscape architects at the time. 
um, you know, it was, uh, now I got to remember. Um, they were uh, Dan Kiley, you older folks might know, Dan Kiley, Peter Walker, uh, Barbara Sussman, and there's one other I can't remember. Um, but uh, anyway, they were all, they were all, uh, you know, I walk in the room and it's like jaw drop. Here I am a year or two out of school and all of a sudden it's me and four of the, four of the most renowned landscape architects uh, in the world at that time. And uh, so we got into our little charrette, right? And I'm just back on a fly on the wall and I start listening to all these, these landscape architects talking and the talking gets louder and louder and then they're yelling at each other. And then one guy's gone into one room and one guy's gone into another room and their egos are really getting to them. And they said, oh, I'll be back in an hour. I, I got this all figured out. I'll be back in an hour. Every single one of them did that. They just, got, they just couldn't work together. But when they all came back, um, they laid down their drawings on the table and they went to go talk about them. And uh, Don Fox, who was the landscape architect at, uh, at uh, Yosemite said, these all look the same. So they're all arguing with each other. They go back into their own, uh, their own little corner of the, the office there. They come back and they all come back with the same design. Exactly what you're seeing there. Show off Yosemite Falls. Don't meander it around. Make it the big deal. And one of the things I learned from that is don't shy away from the obvious solution, right? Um, that there, there was an obvious solution there. And, and, and for me, this has now become a sense of place for many people, but the reason for me is as, a, as an attachment to that experience that I had. Okay, who can tell me? <laughs> okay, Dave. That is Oklahoma City. This is the site of the Oklahoma City bombing. Now, oh, yeah. oh brown nosing. I'll get you every, every time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So this is. <laughs> there, there you go. Beggars, beggars, you're all beggars. Um, this is, the, this is the site of the Oklahoma City bonnet bombing. Um, some of you may or may not be too young to remember this. I don't, uh, I don't know, but uh, uh, this is where uh, bombing occurred that killed quite a few people, uh, including uh, small kids. And they turned it into a park, a memorial. Uh, quite a beautiful place, but this becomes a sense of place probably because something, an important event occurred. And so, you can use an activity. Okay. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Washington, D.C., right there. Okay, okay. Yeah, you want to. Kensington, Chevy Chase, what, what, yeah, specific. Do you know the street address? <laughs> okay. Did you live in there nearby? Okay. Uh, this is the Washington, D.C. temple. Uh, yes, it is a temple, so, so there is kind of a sense of place, a sense of, of, of not only activity, but, um, you know, uh, the locals, uh, the locals there have a name for this temple, and it's not the Washington, D.C. temple. The, uh, bonus candy. Does anybody know what, they, what this is called? By by uh, default by by nickname. Nope, nope. Yes, it's called Oz. Um, and 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 on, on traffic reports, they'll have traffic reports and they'll say, okay, out by Oz, there's a there's a tra there's an incident uh, out there, and uh, everybody knows where it is. One of the reasons that it's called Oz is because of a local beer <laughs> called Surrender Dorothy. Oh, okay. So here we go. We have uh, 
I don't know if this girl's name is Dorothy, but uh, but we now have a we have a beer, and so this local beer and uh, surrender Dorothy. They used to have a big old banner uh, across the bridge of the freeway that said "Surrender Dorothy" right as you're coming up out to see this, but. A place doesn't necessarily become a place because of a picture, but it can become a place because of, um, you know, uh, again, activities. Uh, so, so why is creating a sense of place important? Um, because we have a longing to belong, don't we? We want to belong to something. And, and whatever your thing is, you all have different things that you, you are involved with and you love to belong to. Uh, this group, landscape architectures, uh, la landscape architects, and landscape architecture. They, we we have a group here, and we 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 have our familiarity with each other, and and in our your commons area, and getting together and having these kinds of events. Um, but we have a longing to belong, um, and so how does this apply to church uh, church landscape architecture? Well, when we talk about site design for landscape architecture, and when I am or for temples, and when I am uh, trying to train new uh, new consultants that have never done a, a temple site, I talk to them about the most important thing that they can do is to reflect the local culture and image of the area that that temple will be placed in. So, for example, um, you know. When I first got started at, at, uh, uh, at the church, one of the calls I got was from Orlando, Florida. And it was from the, man, uh, the site manager there. And he said, hey, these junipers down here are looking terrible. Can we get rid of them? And I said, you have junipers in Orlando, Florida on your site? What, what are they thinking? And I said, absolutely. Let's change this area. Let's make it look like Orlando, Florida. And so um, that's that's one thing we can we we talk we talk about when we're training. Uh, the next is attachment. Whether you're a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints or whether you're a visitor, it doesn't matter. You should have a similar experience of peace and order and progression as you come on to a temple site and you walk around the grounds. There are so many people that all, they never go into a temple, but they enjoy the temple grounds. I'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, if I don't run out of time. The other is activity. Temples and other facilities are places where significant events occur, such as the, the wedding, you know, the bride that you saw just previously. Photos of families, uh, these big events that happen often uh, for members of the church. The temple is is kind of where they put the picture of the, they put a picture on their wall in their home. Uh, their family at the temple uh, goes up on their wall in their home. So temples are a very important part of the activities of the of, of the church members. I'm going to talk about religion in general for just a second. Um, when I was in Madrid, Spain uh, a few years ago, um, the people I was with said, hey, um, do you want to go see this, this new park they're building? And so we went to this new park we're building and we're, we're just walking around and this is a huge regional park and uh, that was fairly new. And we came across this one section of the park that talked about the three cultures the three religious, main religious cultures of the world, uh, well, of a lot of the world, uh, Christianity, Muslim, and, and Jewish, right? Judaism. And what they had done is they had created three different areas to reflect those three religions. And in the Christian uh, design, it was all about the cross, okay? In the Muslim design, I'm gonna go back one. You can see in, in 3D, the cross and, and, in, and in 3D, uh, the bell, you know, a, a, a bell ringing at the church, right? And that's what you have over there. 
Whereas in the Muslim, you have these the entry arches and coming into a, a mosque or something like that. Um, and then uh, in Judaism, they had created this fountain that had the shape of uh, of the of, of the star. And and I thought that was interesting. Um, in that they were wanting people to have a relationship with this new park, no matter who they were, and that they had a place that said, hey, this is part of me. This is important to me. And when you look at Christianity all around, uh, this, is, this is a three-part uh, candy bar question, okay? Where is this picture? Did you already get one? Okay, I'm going with somebody who doesn't. This is the Vatican, which is in where? Rome, okay? This is the Vatican in Rome. If I were to say to you, where is the, uh, where is the center of Christianity? You would say the Vatican in Rome, right? It's kind of what we would all say. If I were to say to you, where's the center of Judaism? Jerusalem, right? More the Wailing Wall, uh, that area, but Jerusalem. Where's the center of uh, Islam, uh, Muslim, Muslim? Mecca, right? Okay, one over here. <laughs> All right. Um, but religion, religion, a sense of place is very, very important to religion. And to the members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, where is their center? All right, who, who raised their hand? Nobody raised their hand for that one. Okay, Sam over here in the white, right here. I don't know if he, I don't know if he answered, but he was the first one to raise his hand. <laughs> um, so what gives this loca location a sense of place? Temple Square. You have all the, all the things that identify as, as, a, as a sense of place uh, with identity and attachment and activity, right? Identity, a very unique building, unlike any other in the world. Not only is this building unique, tabernacle is unique, temple is unique, the conference center is unique. All of them are unique. And so architecturally, this is a unique place. Uh, temple Square itself, the, wall, you know, the walls of Temple Square, very unique. Um, and then attachment, obviously, members of the church, um, if, if they want, if they can, want to come to Salt Lake to see Temple Square. And then activity, of course, thousands of weddings every year, right? And other activities within. Here's the conference center. Now we're going to talk about some specific work that I've been involved with. Uh, how many of you have taken the conference center or gone up to the roof and just seen the conference center? Okay, this was one of my first projects uh, on the, with the church um, right after I got hired. Um, we worked with Olin Partnership out of Philadelphia to um, come up with a solution to the question of can we build a... a gathering place that'll hold 20 to 30,000 people. The tabernacle only held about 4,500. And so President Hinckley wanted a bigger, a bigger building. And we said, yeah, we could build a supernacle. <laughs> and uh, that didn't go over so well. And then Lori, Lori Olin and um, our architects from ZGF stood on this corner back here and said, you know what? This is all about a garden experience, not a building. And what they, what they talked about, uh, this, this thing, having a sense of place, was the relationship that this building would have with its surrounding environment. Okay? And so, as you look at the mountains, you look at the foothills, you look at the, uh, and you look at, uh, the meadows and, and, and the valleys, and even going down south, you see the mesas, you realize that the, the conference center, especially this side right here, representing the mesas of Southern Utah, even though it's not in red sandstone, but it's, it's this flat building that just comes to a drop off, right? 
And then as you look at the top of the, of the conference center and make your way down, you start with the headwaters at the very top. And uh, I'll go back again. Notice the headwaters right here. Okay. And then we have water elements coming from these headwaters, dropping down these stairs in creeks or runnels, coming to pools, dropping off the waterfall. And then we have the creek running along North Temple Street there. Uh, and, that's, and that's kind of the, the, the theme of, of that conference center and its sense of place became, how can we relate this to those people who live here? And it was twofold. One is don't make the building so big that it dwarfs the temple and don't make the grounds so fancy that they dwarf temple squares, flowers, and, and that beauty. So they went a totally different direction and went more uh, indigenous um, to that design. And here's the creek um, at the bottom. And like I said, I worked with, uh, I worked with Olin Partnership, uh, have a great relationship with them. Uh, just love working with Olin and still talk to the people uh, there once in a while when I can. Um, but they didn't want to do the creek. So my first project and just being here at the church, they said, Kevin, you do the creek. We'll do everything else. Well, it was, it was, it was obviously a, a combined effort, but uh, this is my little, my little baby here. <laughs> <laughs> Even though I can tell you that I have been on every square inch of that building doing inspections and acting as the local liaison for, for, for Olin and just the partnership that we had there working together to make this all work. Um, 10 acre site, 1400 trees were planted originally on this, on this building. Uh, and they are all on the building, okay? Whether it's parking garage or building, 1400 trees are, are planted on this building. And uh, you know, it changed, and then just like this, the, the canyons, the, the east side and the north side reflect the, the north facing slopes of the canyons. And then you have the mesas on the other side, which reflect the, the, the southern, um, the southern uh, Utah landscape. It was no small effort. <clears throat> part, of the, part of the sense of attachment was and is still having volunteers help us. And uh, to do the meadow on top, took 180,000 plants to be planted. And so we planted 180,000 plants in two weekends using about 250 volunteers. Uh, they pulled, they, they took, made their chains and put the plants up on top, right? And then when they got up on top, we had our head gardeners all take a different area and seven different climate zones on top of this uh, conference center and lots of little shovels. And they would, they would lay it out and as fast as they could, uh, our gardeners could lay out uh, the plants, the volunteers would try to dig through that rocky soil and put them in that light, it's a lightweight soil that we had up there. It wasn't easy to dig, but we did it in two weekends. And that was, and that was an incredible experience for me. And now today um, we have a meadow. Um, have we had some issues? Absolutely. Um, do we, how do we rejuvenate that? Well, you know, in the prairies, they rejuvenate with fire. Our, our head gardener wanted to have some burnings up on top of the roof, but uh, that wasn't allowed. So, um, we, so different times of the year, you can go and it's amazingly, uh, diverse and different every time you go, uh, June versus August, you know, uh, March versus September. Um, and here we are in the middle of Salt Lake City. Um, but it is a token to the surrounding areas. So I want to take a look at a, a how, how do we do that with a few temples? How do we give, how do we give, um, 
those around the world are not going to be able to come to Salt Lake City uh, most, of, most often. And so how do we give them a little piece of feeling like they belong? And one of the things that we do these days is we try to look at precedents in the area. Raise your hand if you know where this is. That's Versailles. Okay, in France. So Versailles in France is literally the garden of France, right? And fortunately or unfortunately, our temple is, is a three minute walk from an entrance to Versailles. And so using Versailles as a precedence, obviously our little two acre site is not gonna be able to compete with, you know, the miles of Versailles that are, that are there, obviously. And so we looked at the elements. We looked at the lanterns. Um, we looked at the, wa we looked at the uh, water. Um, oops. We looked at the water features. We looked at the gardens. You know, we looked at the, the, the elements that are used on Versailles and we, and we said to ourselves, how can we make a, a garden that's little itty bitty tiny have some of a feeling of this is your garden, Paris. This is for you. Um, yeah, we know Versailles is just across the street and you can go there anytime, but how can we make you feel like this is part of, uh, part of your uh, life as well? And so you can see the allays. Whoops, I keep wanting to hit the red button. You can see the allays that we created. Um, this is the entry into the courtyard garden. This is the temple. Okay. You can see the water features coming in here and water feet on here. Uh, some trees that we've espaliered, you know, cut off square, just like you do in France. Uh, and then uh, some other areas. And then we do this. Um, like I said, this is like two acres versus thousands for Versailles. And so here's a, a look up uh, towards uh, the main entry. Um, you can see some of the elements that we used. We use a, a Portuguese uh, uh, stone paver, which is used, or, uh, which is used a lot in France. Um, looking back, you can see those trees squared up, just like you'd see on the boulevard right in front of the temple. Uh, you can also see the water feature used as a, as a focal point and some of the detailing again uh, with, with the materials and the, and the light posts. So this is looking the other direction. Uh, very rigid, right? France is all about controlling nature. They want to control everything about it. And so even the, uh, even the trees you know, uh, formally pruned use instead of just leaving them nice and round. Um, again, the allays, but in here, I wanted you to notice like the, even on Versailles, they just have these boxes that they bring out with the trees uh, for the summertime. And then they throw them into a greenhouse in the fall. We looked at some details where we could use that here. And then we also added, you know, it, on some side paths, we did some DG, which is, which is the main paving for, for all of Versailles. Um, so some of these little details, maybe you don't pick up normally, but it gives you a feeling that, you, that it is a French garden. Um, you know, this is obviously part of Versailles as well. And then we also brought in the little boxwood hedges uh, with the flowers, even when the flowers aren't there, still has a strong French influence. Um, you can see the, the light posts. Even though our temple is very modern design, because there's no way you're going to compete with the cathedrals and the mansions and, and Versailles and everything, all that architecture, we went the opposite direction. We went simple on the building and put, it, put the details into the landscape. Even the statues, we, we, looked, we looked and learned from the statues that in Versailles, we noticed that all the statues always had a green background to them. And one of the things that we ended up doing is we ended up putting a Christus on this site 
And so we had the, uh, as you can see, the background behind it, right? And, um, and one night uh, when I was at this site, I came into the courtyard, came into the garden, and this was really cool. I saw a French couple had brought their wine and their cheese and their little baguettes and, and whatever. And they were sitting on this bench enjoying an evening in the temple gardens at Versailles because it was their place. That was so cool. Um, that obviously not members of the church, but they felt comfortable enough to come in and enjoy an evening. That was way cool. All right. You can be somewhat specific or not specific, but what, at least what country is this in? Anybody, anybody know? Nope. Here, I'll give you a hint. Look at that detail right there. Dave, you want some more candy? No, I'm good. It, this is Sapporo, Japan. Okay, I thought this would be an easier answer looking at, looking at that little guy right there and the bridge and everything. Um, Losai uh, out of Salt Lake was the main ar uh, landscape architect for this and they did an awesome job and I appreciate all of the temples that they worked on. Um, but when we decided to do Sapporo, Japan, it was not that there was be, the temple actually sits down below the road. The road's like 20 feet higher than the temple that goes in front of this. And it, there's a river in back of it and it kind of sits kind of in between. And we decided that it needed to be a temple in a garden rather than a temple with a garden. And so we created a Japanese garden in this uh, location. And we looked at some of the details around and you see the bat, batter, battened walls, battered walls. Um, that slant, uh, some of those details. And you look at uh, the trees and how they're pruned, you know, in the Japanese kind of very clean Japanese style as opposed to France, right? We were just in France. This is uh, how they do it in Japan. It's a little different. Um, and here we have a, a pond. Uh, this pond actually, and, and with the bridge, this pond, uh, comes from a waterfall. The street level is up above there. And so we have this waterfall that comes down and drops into the pond. And so the temple looks straight out to this waterfall and, um, and, and is used quite a bit for obviously photography. And, uh, and just, I, I, I just love what Losai did. And I, and, and I love how this turned out. Uh, we got to actually pick the stones personally uh, on for the main stones of this of this walkway, and this is the front of the temple. The plaza is right here, and those steps just drop right down into the pond, which was a lot of fun to be able to do that and being allowed to do that. Um, so, Japan, a Japanese garden, again, a, a place that they can relate to rather than looking like Bountiful Utah, right? Okay, anybody. No, close, not even close. Nope. Tijuana. This is Tijuana. Tijuana was a lot of fun too. Also, also done by local landscape architecture firm, MGBA. Tijuana developed, uh, re, you know, you guys were good in, in knowing it was south, south of the border uh, uh, by the details. And again, a lot of these details. I even love how the palm tree colors emulated the paving and the, and, the, and the roof colors. I mean, that was really cool. And I'm gonna go through some of these others a little bit more quickly because we're running short on time. But next, where's this? Rome, yep. You know, make Rome look like the Rome, temp the Rome temple look like it belongs in Rome. And we, again, did not want to compete with the architecture of Rome. We just, so we went with a modern building, but we did look at all the, the flora, 
uh, of the area and, and we're able to do some things that were pretty incredible. And then also using the paving. Um, this paving right here is recycled paving from some street in Rome that got dug up. We don't know if those stones right there are 100 years old or if they're 700 years old, right? Uh, but that is recycled paving uh, that they've used. And then you can see uh, the stone pines are a big part. And on our site, we also had some stone pines that we saved. There were two sections of them, one on both sides of the temple. We put the temple right in the middle of these stone pines. We were able to save those and uh, really, really creates a strong image to the Italians that this is their temple. We also had a number of olive trees on site. One of my favorite things I, I, I got to do was to go pick out these olive trees. Um, we had about 60 trees on site that we, that we put around the site. Uh, re, we re, replanted around the site, but they weren't really that great. Uh, we did it because olive trees are important in Christianity, right? Uh, Garden of Gethsemane and things like that. But we had these four quadrants within the main plaza where we wanted some really special trees. And it took us three trips to find the trees. And we finally found some three and 400 year old olive trees. That's what this is, uh, that, that had some character to them. Kind of re would remind you of the Garden of Gethsemane and put those as our, rather than statues, we use trees. So how, we've gone internationally. How does this apply locally? Well, anybody know where this is? Meridian, Meridian, Idaho. Uh, on Meridian, Idaho, in, in all the parks and around every, everywhere in Meridian, they have all these basins. They're using these basins for irrigation. And so they pump out and, and do this. Rather than stick this detention basin out on the side of the property, we decided to create this as an element of the main part of the temple site. And so it's become kind of a favorite location to take pictures and things on these, on these steps right here that just step up to one of the main plazas there. And so, you know, we used, we used that as, as the main thing. Anybody know where this is? Close by? Brigham City. Brigham City. Anybody know what happened in Brigham City? Brigham City is, is what is it a part of Utah? Fruit trees? Yes. It's, it's the fruitway, right? Brigham City and all that little area is the fruitway. And so we were asked to actually put real live fruit trees on the site, which was awesome. So now we have peach trees out by the main sign. We have apple trees in the back of the building. And then they all got mad at me because what are we gonna do? This fruit's all messy. Well, we put it in ground cover areas so the fruit would drop on the ground cover instead of on the lawn or on the sidewalks. And, but they were still mad at me. What are we doing with all these fruit trees? And then we had Elder Packer go visit. He's from Brigham City. And he says, do you have, did you put fruit trees on the site? And I said, oh, yes, Elder Packer, we have fruit trees on the site. He said, look, we'll show you. We have peach trees. We have apple trees. We have, uh, uh, let's see, what, pear trees. And he says, well, do you have an apricot tree? Oh. I got a call an hour later. Kevin, we need to put an apricot tree on the, uh, on the Brigham City Temple. And so we ended up putting two uh, just for Elder Packer. <laughs> but a unique experience. We also have fruit trees in Mesa, except those are all citrus. Uh, that was a big part of during the Depression uh, to feed the people in Mesa in the 30s. They had a big, big, um, a big wide open lawn area. And so they planted all citrus trees and fed a lot of people in Mesa during the Depression, uh, in the 30s, um, uh, to get, help them get by. And so we've just done a major renovation and we installed more. Uh, citrus trees on, on Mesa. We also use some of the stone on, on, uh, on Brigham City Temple that you can see is the same stone that's over here on the tabernacle across the street and its relationship. So we've, we've done that. The MTC sense of place, right? And, and one of the things that we've done there, bring in the flags, that's an easy one, right? Uh, and make that, uh, make that a sense of place. 
Nowadays, the temples uh, are not always on hills like you see here. Um, and so, and so they're, even though they are beacons, they might be down in a hole like Sapporo is. They might be up on a hill. This is, anybody want to guess where this is? I'll bet you can't. Durban, South Africa. Oh, yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, awesome. Okay. The cool thing about Durban is it's a little temple, yet you can see it from the highway miles away. Uh, that's a busy highway. And so it is a beacon on the hill. And the details of Durban, we brought in some of the paving details of, of, of uh, the African uh, tribes and things like that into, into some of the paving that we used there. And uh, I just wanna close, I know I've gone way over time, by just remembering that I might be the landscape architect for the church, but it takes everybody to build these temples. And those people are not all members of the church. Some are Muslim, some are Jewish, some aren't religious at all, but they all are a major part of the temple. And I hope that as, as they are built, it becomes a sense of, of an important place to these folks and to those that live in the areas. And um, I just wanted to thank you for the time today and uh, we'll open up to two questions. <laughs> I'm out of time. Yep. Okay. Thank you so much, Kevin. Um, any questions I can walk over? Yeah. Hey, Kevin, thanks. Um, my name is Brent Chamberlain. and I'm fairly new to the faculty here. And I hail from a place where 90 some percent of the grass seed in the United States is grown. Do you know where that is? The Pacific Northwest, not Idaho. Um, I don't know, is this, a... it's on, check, check, check. Yeah, it's okay. Um, so I was really curious when I came here to see how much grass there is everywhere. And I know there's this like, like to see this, I haven't seen many of these pictures. I haven't visited temples. I know there's one in Portland. I didn't get a chance to visit that when I was younger. Um, so there's like so much thought that goes into the, the connection between the places that exist. But because we're in this sort of like germane issue of today of water, I'm wondering where the like, the integration of grass that's like from a place that's always wet uh, is involved in the design aspects of so many of these different temples. I don't know how to, I don't know how to get to my uh, uh, hidden slides, but uh, one of the things that I was going to show that is um, we are being more and more uh, uh, cognizant of the water use that we do that we do so that's another thing that we do to bring that uh, original uh, geogra geographic culture is to not have you know not ha not bring a big lawn into some place that's like Tucson Arizona right and so uh, we we really spend a lot of time and really are conscientious about how much lawn we do put on temple sites and we always ask that question, is this too much? Is this appropriate? And, and sometimes, you know, the answer is you shouldn't have any lawn on there. Okay. Um, one, of the, one of the things, the slides that I was gonna put up was Adelaide, Australia. When we first did Adelaide, Australia, 90% uh, lawn. It was just one of your typical ugly uh, landscapes that was just lawn and a few trees because it just was one of those 50 temples that went in just really fast. Adelaide ran out of water and they had to build salinization plants and we had to turn off our water on our entire landscape. And so we went in and we created a drought tolerant landscape that was capable of, of only using what we were allowed to use. And so that was a lesson to us and that kind of turned the tide for us to be able to do that with our leadership as opposed to just the traditional Look at our green lawn type thing, yeah. 
Yeah, thanks for the presentation. Um, the one thing that I've always noticed is, and seems confirmed by what you're saying is um, when people are, when you're thinking about making temple sites, the interplay between the landscape and the architecture itself is really, really important. And I've noticed over the years, and even in looking back to precedents, the style of temple and the architecture and its function and even the sort of values behind it have ebbed and flowed into different ways. You know, in the 90s and early 2000s, it was all cookie cutter, low cost, you know, very similar um, foot floor plans just kind of smattered everywhere. And then now we've sort of gotten back into this trying to be more place based, like you said. But I have noticed that, at least with some of the recent ones I've seen, they they're very nice and uh, have a great vernacular to them, but seem to be very historical in nature. And I wonder of, as that shifts in the future, I, I'm thinking of like Frankfurt Temple as a precedent, right? It was very much of its time, like mid-century, modern sort of thing. I guess it was built later than that, but, um, and I think of where do you see that going in the future, the interplay between landscape and architecture as we kind of go from this historical precedent period into something that might be contemporary or might be more about sustainability or do you have any thoughts on that? I have a lot of thoughts on that. <laughs> um, as I mentioned, we use, we try to go around, uh, we'll go to a site wherever it is, architects will go to sites and they'll, they'll look at precedents, right? Uh, those precedents oftentimes are uh, government buildings, uh, churches, uh, maybe other buildings in the area, but they do lean, they do tend to lean towards the old, right? And the one reason they tend to do that is because they want to create a temple that is timeless. And, and so we try not to get into the, uh, the gearies and, and all the, 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 the trendy stuff, right? And so oftentimes, Classical architecture, especially in the last 15 years, classical uh, is, is the way that they have gone on many, many temples uh, because classical can come in many layers, but the classical proportions of a temple always work. And you can just add or subtract those layers as fancy as you want to get. And so, um, but like I mentioned on Rome and in, and in Paris, sometimes we don't want to compete with that, with what's there. So we go, a, we go a more modern route. Uh, I don't know if that answered your question or. Yeah, and I guess specifically thinking of how, how the landscape plays in. Yeah, and the landscape, it does the same thing. We look at precedents. And uh, let me tell you a really, a really interesting example. Sapporo Temple, um, sometimes we miss, okay? And I'm going to give you an example of where we missed, but we don't know if we missed for sure or just missed locally. In, in, in Japan, uh, it's not like here. In, it, here, we would think stone pavers would be the best, concrete pavers would be next, then concrete, asphalt, and then DG or something would be kind of the priority of best to worst paving patterns, paving stuff, right? Well, we got, after we were done with Sapporo, they said, how come all the con oh, how come all the sidewalks are concrete? That's like the worst material. Why didn't you do them in asphalt? Like, do all the sidewalks and the plazas in asphalt? And they say, yeah. It's for us. It's all about the oil. The oil in the asphalt is seen as a richer material. And so culturally, culturally, we missed it, right? We could have gone really cheap, <laughs> but we but we didn't. Uh, and, 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 and we've had that with temples, too, that we said, oh, we have so much of this old classical stuff. Why couldn't you have done something more modern? And so, you know, we use precedents. Sometimes we nail it. Sometimes we don't. Okay. I know we're over time, but I, I'll be willing to take any questions. If you have. We'll do one more, and then we have... We will have a reception after, a little more informal. I was hoping to see the LA, the Los Angeles temple, because I could have won that one. But um, speaking of lawn, yeah. holy smokes, 
No, that's what I wanted to know. I haven't been there in a while, but I grew up right there. So tell us about, because it's not, it was the biggest lawn, like in all of LA. All right. <laughs> this, is, this is true. Other than golf, all the, other, other than golf courses in any house in Bel Air, <laughs> um, we had this huge lawn, just like Logan has that huge hillside, times that by three. Uh, that was our that was our lawn that was our lawn facing south uh, in LA. Two years ago, we came in, we reduced that lawn by probably seventy five percent, and uh, created. You can Google Earth it if you want to Google that image up here. We can show you. But um, so, but but then we put uh, a lot of really drought tolerant stuff on the sides along the bottom and a little bit along the top. But here's what we did. Because we had the precedent of so many photos and everything, people taking them up the lawn, up the hill and everything, we kept that view and reduced the amount of lawn by 75%, and, but maintained the, the view that, that has been the historical view of the, of the temple. So from the sign up, we kept the lawn. And uh, we had some struggles uh, with, the, with the plant material uh, for a while, but I think it's starting to come into its own now. And it's like I said, it's only two, three years. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That temple's been, talk about mid-century modern. That's, that's, that's the one that was mid-century modern, right? All right. Jeff Google Earth. Or Google. Sorry. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. What is coming up in conversation, and I'm part of uh, some committees right now, uh, in, in, in another sense of what you're saying is sustainability, right? And we're looking as a church, how do we build and maintain sustainable things, including landscapes, including buildings? And uh, we are, uh, we've been tasked with being better, right? And um, one, of the, one of the things that um, we, we realize, and we did this with our meeting houses a long time ago, uh, as we went to uh, more of the uh, indigenous plantings. And uh, like right now, if you were to build a new meeting house uh, in Utah, you're not allowed to put any more than 35% of the, of the landscape into lawn. 65% of it has to be in a shrub or a tree or some kind of other bed. And we knew that if we started to do that, then other neighbors would see that. And if we did a good job with that, they'd say, hey, that looks pretty cool. And so uh, we see ourselves as, as, as wanting to be good neighbors. Sometimes we're not the best at what we're doing and we don't get the, we don't get the PR that we probably should out there to, to say what we're doing, but, um, but we are trying. Great example. So all of this used to be lawn, right? And so like I was saying, we maintained the, the, the area between the, the two pods of, of being in lawn. So we still have that 
iconic picture that everybody used to get. But you can see thousands of plants got planted, and they're all and they're all drought tolerant. So we're using I don't know how much less water, fifty percent less water, or more on that on that hillside. So did we do okay? Okay. <laughs> Yeah. So there we go. All right. Thank you so much. Yeah, let's give Kevin one more round of applause. Thank you so much. So we will be doing a more informal, uh, just kind of meet and greet up in the common studio and any and all are welcome just right, right after this.